One of the most beautiful books I've ever read was a book called Impro by Keith Johnston. And he's a British theater teacher who tried to create a kind of rule book for how to treat the theater as a safe space for you to recolonize in a way the right side of your brain. The part of your brain that, according to him, gets taken away when you're expected to show up to places on time or have a factual understanding of the world. He has this very funny exercise where you point out an object and you give it a new name out loud. Chicken. Telescope. Daniel. Rock. Rock. And as an adult, you realize that's super hard. I can point out this table and I'm thinking table, table, table. But he says when you try the same experiment with a child, they have no fixed model for the table. Table is like as good as water bottle, Mars, toilet. The whole premise of his improv strategy is that that part of you is still inside you somewhere. It's stuck inside you. It's the part that comes out when you dream. It's the part that comes out when you're not anxious, when you're relaxed, when you're in the moment of things. And he uses improv in a way as the scaffolding or the structure or the portal to get you to that mental state again. I've been really influenced by this because it presents a model of the mind that has multiple agents encompassed in one body and have them flicker between these different ways of being. My very first works were animated videos, but I felt that seeing a beginning, middle, and end had its limits in describing the behavior of a character. Now, Walt Disney or Miyazaki has the benefit that their characters are so larger than life, they keep growing like the way your cousin keeps growing or your dog keeps growing. But within a discrete artwork, to capture that expansiveness of a person is really hard. I felt that a simulation could be a form where there was no beginning or end. Simulation for me is like a video game that plays itself. Unlike a, a film or video, or even an animation where you forever commit a character to how you drew it and how you animated it, this thing can animate itself. And given enough environmental stimulus, which I do by creating a virtual ecosystem for these agents and other agents, it can adapt and change its own behavior or not, as happens in life. I feel like the earlier simulations are really focused on trying to create a world. But more and more I find that for me it's been more focusing and interesting to try to create a mind. To try to model artificial intelligence or mind that is resilient enough to be picked out of one world and dropped into another is an analogy, I think, to our own ability to accommodate and tolerate really indeterminate situations that we find ourselves in all the time. In the simulation, Emissary and the Squad of Gods, I tried to simulate an ancient community facing a threat for the first time. And it's based loosely on the work of the psychiatrist Julian Jaynes, who had a very controversial hypothesis in the 70s that ancient people weren't conscious. You and I hear an internal voice and we perceive it to be a voice that comes from us, but he hypothesizes that ancient people perceive that voice to be the hallucination of other people or other voices emanating inside you to make decisions. I love this idea that there's a metaphorical congress inside you. There's the Ian that wants to retreat from all change in the world. And there's the Ian that's supposed to be working right now but it's procrastinating. There's the Ian who hopes that everything I say is going to be meaningful. But then if I can see this moment as an opportunity, it can be a kind of portal into really tolerating this uncertainty, this ambiguity, this weirdness, and perhaps even surf it or learn to, in a way, love it. And if I can do that, whether that's certain forms of self-help or whether that's through art, this is the most exciting Ian. In my most relaxed and lucid moments, I feel that certain people in that Congress deserve more voice than others. And I'm trying to cultivate that.